This is Litopia. Go on, take your socks off. Oh, yes, we're doing it again. I can't believe it. Uh, We like it so much, and hopefully you do too. It's pop-up submissions for Sunday. Aloha. Uh, (laughs) uh, For Sunday, the 18th of August. You should be on holiday, actually. Um, 2019. Now, this is it's like open source, basically, isn't it? That's really what we're doing. It's open source submissions. Submissions are something that was always private and closed and in a dark room. You never knew what they got up to until you got a letter about six months later saying, we don't like your work. Well, none of that now. This is where it all happens live, folks. Uh, next 55 minutes or so, you're going to see some excellent submissions. Uh, you're going to pick up no end of writing tips. And you're going to have a fabulous guest or two. So, well, what's not to like about that? Let's bring you up to speed with a little bit of news, shall we? Um, I need to bring your attention to the Aesthetica. Creative Writing Award that's very, very soon to close. So if you haven't got your application in now, you should do it immediately without delay. Um, And as I never tire of saying, one of the prizes is me. You can take me home and I'll cook you dinner. No, well, actually, I could, but it would be vegan. Um, It's a session or two with me. And uh, I've done this for several years running now. I've completely enjoyed it. And I think the, the winner has got something out of it as well. Um, something you can get a lot out of right now is this. Lose your inhibitions and find your voice in Latopia's Flash Club. Every month, a new micro-writing challenge designed to get your creative juices really flowing. Hone your writing skills while you're having fun. Another membership benefit from Litopia. Check it out now. Oh, yes, do check it out. And while you're checking stuff out, you'll probably see on the show lots of interesting little... Um, I don't want to call them other than QR codes. You've just seen these things around a huge amount. So if you see a QR, QR, QR code pop up in the next few minutes, this is what to do. See this? It's called a QR code. Scan it with your phone. It'll take you straight to the website we're talking about. That's what you do. It's very simple. It's, it, it, it's, it's amazing what technology can do these days. Why don't we move quickly now to meet our What if this is as good as it gets? I can assure you it gets a lot better than this. First of all, uh, an old friend who needs no introduction, nevertheless, I'm always one to use more words than necessary, I think. Hello, Carol. How nice to have you back on again. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Well, it'll get even lovelier. Now then, let's not mess around. Have you got a book for us? Yes. Um, Gold Dust Woman by Stephen Davis, who has authored lots of rock star biographies in the past. And I Mm. picked this up because I saw it on Amazon and because I absolutely adore Stevie Nicks and actually never read a book about her. Interestingly enough, though, there are mistakes in here. And one of them is fairly early on. He gets her birth date wrong. So I thought, hmm. I know. So I went on Amazon, which I never do, and read the reviews. And apparently this thing is littered with mistakes, which- Oh, no. I know. So I thought this would be a this would be a good example because this gentleman has quite a reputation and like I said he's authored lots of rock star biographies in the past. Yeah. And I don't know if I don't know if they're all like this or if you know he just he had a new editor was asleep yeah. at the wheel. I don't know what, but I thought it's a really good example for people that even with a non-fiction book, you yeah. got to do your research and you got to proofread your work. Uh, and because you've got to it, correct. it's a fascinating yeah, yeah it's got a correct. fascinating story, but now oh, okay. I don't know how much of it I'm reading is true. <laughs> That's really interesting, actually. Um, I mean, this kind of thing does happen. It might have happened to me a little bit in the past. Who knows? But, um, mm. you know, this is why you have reprints and things, and especially in this day and age with e-books. I mean, you, you know, if, mm-hmm. if, the, if there's a community of people out there saying this is wrong, that's wrong, and, and something else is wrong, then there's no excuse, actually. I mean, the publisher's got to be asleep at the wheel. 
There's no excuse. Right. They've got to correct it. Right. They can correct it, you know, very quickly, and the ebook could be updated. And if, if that is not the case, that's 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 a great shame. Nevertheless, it's a it good is. read, is it? Very good read. Very Excellent. good read. Fascinating, fascinating story of how the band got started, how she got started, and and then it goes into her solo career, and she's still going strong. She's that's just great. an amazing woman. One of my That's idols. That's fantastic. Good. And now we're going to meet our very, very special guest, because uh, Carol's a special guest. It's a very, very special guest indeed. Emma Robinson. Um, Emma Hello. writes... Hello, Emma. All the way from... Essex in England. Essex. Are you a natural-born <laughs> Essex girl? Absolutely, 100%. Fantastic. The best, the best. <laughs> Emma writes the blog Motherhood for Slackers, which takes a humorous and sometimes touching look at motherhood through poetry and verse. And you, Emma, are the author of four novels, The Undercover Mother, Happily Never After, One Way Ticket to Paris, and Where I Found You. It's just been published, wasn't it? Just published on Friday. Literally, yeah. Hot off the presses on Friday. So very yeah. exciting. Is this your first media appearance? Uh, first of this kind of show, I would say. I've been on a couple of... I, I, my children laugh at me for not knowing the correct vocabulary. Vlogs, I've been on a couple of those. Oh. But um, nothing nothing like this in, in terms of uh, speaking to other, other, uh, other writers. So that's yeah. particularly exciting. It is exciting. It's exciting for us. So um, we ha we what you don't know is we sent... I'm going to surprise and shock you now. We sent... Ooh our own undercover cameraman along to your book launch on Friday, and this is what we found. <laughs> and I've got to say, you guys in Essex, you certainly know how to hold a party. That's extraordinary. But oh, our... What's even funny is it's not far different. It was not far different from that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But our guy, who apparently had an amazing time at your launch, stuck around for the, for the morning after. And I believe your husband's name is Daniel. Is that right, Daniel? That's right. This is Daniel That's the amazing. next, next day. Right. Not so hot. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. See, there are, there are people watching, not from the UK, who've never heard of Essex, but my God, by the end of the show, they will have done. Have you got a book for us? <laughs> I have, I have. It's called The Women by Essie Lines. And I picked this book, well, A, because I absolutely loved it. I, um, I read it uh, when I was on holiday this Easter. Um, I think it's really topical. It's really now with the whole uh, Me Too movement and yeah. everything that's going on. So I loved it for that reason. It's a great story. Um, and also I loved it because I think people are very quick to kind of delineate between commercial fiction and literary fiction. Oh, yeah. And I think what Etsy Lines here has done here is actually blurred those lines because what she's written is a very thrilling, page-turning, plot-driven book but the writing's beautiful. Uh, you know, it is literary in nature, the writing. So, I th and that's why I love it, I think, because I really do feel uh, yeah. she's, she's hitting both in this. I, I, I haven't heard of it. I looked at the Amazon page uh, just today. Um, it's extraordinary. It's, it's, it's got, you know, it, it clearly is one of these books that seems to change people's lives, actually. It's got amazing reviews. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. And, and the reviews yeah. have been incredible. And it's another of my soapboxes to be honest because it's when you're with a digital first publisher yeah. you don't get the same exposure in the mainstream press particularly yeah. paper press yeah. uh, you don't get you're not allowed to enter for reviews for awards there's so many charts that you're not that you're excluded from um, and that's why I think books like this I mean obviously it's doing really well but mm. it should be everyone should be reading this book. I really, yeah. you know, I teach yeah. A-level English as well. So I, I really feel that everybody should read this book. And yet, because we're a digital mm. first publisher, mm. there are certain elements that you, that you don't get the exposure. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I think it's extraordinary how certain parts of the publishing business seem to be stuck in the not even 20th century. You know, it's stuck in the yeah. 19th century. It's extraordinary and very exactly. depressing. Yeah. I, I tell you, this year, the, the well, you know, when the Booker Prize list was announced, I just, my heart <laughs> fell through my boots, right? I just thought, is this really the best you could do? We could be talking about Booker Prize circa 1972. 
really. Yeah. It's just, it's yeah. not reflecting, it's not reflecting the commercial realities of the marketplace. It's not reflecting what books, what really good books are, are out there now, but, you know, for one reason or another, are not eligible. Uh, I, I just, it's a small, exclusive, and soon, I think, to be, um, you know, um, to be eclipsed, actually, element in the publishing well, industry that doesn't yeah. really want change. So, I, I, yeah, you yeah, touch a nerve there for I me. Agree. More from Emma in a moment. Right now, we have some work to do. Yes, now then, I think I'd better start to tell you about some of our submissions today, am I? Yeah. Um, this is our first one today. It's from Sanjay. And it is historical fiction. Let me read you Sanjay's blurb. When the son of a British professor discovers that his father is actually of Indian descent, he's drawn to India and meets his other relatives, which leads him on a trail of even more startling revelations about the nature of his family. He's opened to the experience of being treated as a foreigner and an outsider and tries to come to grips with this new facet of his identity. A nuanced story providing an analytical vehicle of Indian history rather than serving as a vassal for blame towards the... And we won't know what Sanjay was going to write there because he was truncated because we only give you a certain amount of space on the uh, on the website to fill the blurb in. But I think we've got the general idea, um, and it might be an even better idea to have this read for us by... Oh, I think best choice for this would be Robert. The first page. Lone Britain by Sanjay Agnihotri. Read by Robert Derry. Chapter 1. A London afternoon, somewhere around 12.30. Kevin parked his car in the portico of the Nancy mansion and hastily entered the house. Mother! Her voice came from her room. I'm here! Don't worry. I'm still alive. Panicking, Kevin ran towards the sound to find his mother, Delcy, nonchalantly sitting up in her bed with some orange juice. A centenarian, Delcy wore an expression of weariness, but tranquillity. On seeing Kevin's panic and lips dry with nervousness, she said, There's nothing to worry about. Dr. Gavin visited and administered the injection along with a dose of the medicine, and I'm fine now. The shock on Kevin's face softened a bit, and he said, I called him as soon as you rang me at work about what happened. I know, he told me. In fact, I called him before I rang you as well. He arrived immediately because, luckily, his clinic was not busy at this time of day. The benefits of having a doctor work next door to you. Sit down. I have something to talk to you about. Kevin felt a bit unsettled, but he dragged a nearby chair towards her and sat. Delcy called out to the nurse for her to bring Kevin some juice as well. Kevin's throat was badly parched. As soon as the juice came before him, he picked it up and said, as he took a large mouthful, Then what was so urgent that you had to summon me from the university to tell me? Look, son, according to Dr. Gavin, I'm not really in danger either. But today, the way I felt along with what me and Dr. Gavin spoke about, I don't think it's wise waiting any longer. I don't understand. There is something I need you to do for me, or rather, my family which is going to take you a long time. Moreover, you're also reaching 75 years of age. But I'm pleased this is a job that Professor Kevin Jones, according to his education experience, or the late, is now qualified for. Thus, the sooner you're told about it, this, the better. Kevin grew impatient. What are you talking about? Why? There are, important, there are some important things of which you are not yet aware. What are you saying? What did the doctor say to you to make you so... Don't interrupt me and listen. Delcy's voice grew with gravity and sternness. Until now, everything you think you know about your father is not untrue. But not completely true either. I don't understand. I'm going to have to go into some details to explain myself. The truth is, my husband, the late Mr. Robert Jones, was not your father but your uncle. I adopted you from my sister and your mother, Alice Jones, which is why, in truth, I am not your mother, but your aunt. Upon saying this much, 
Dulcie cast her eyes to Kevin to gauge his reaction. He did not understand how to take the news, and such was his expression. Dulcie began to continue. Your real father, Alice's husband, was an Indian man by the name of King Rakavendra Singh Jadoon, and your birth name is not Kevin Jones, but Prince Keval Singh Jadoon. You are the Prince of Chanangar, your father's principality. As, as far as I know, there is no longer any monarchy in India, and in 1971, the government abolished the Privy Purse. All the so-called princes are worthless, Kevin said, recoiling. I know, and I'm not telling you all this so that you go and become the holder of the principality and the inheritance and the reaper of the Privy Purse profits. The truth is that there lies your sister, the daughter of King Raghavendra, and I want you to go and find her. This time, Delcy got to the end of her sentence in one breath. Just then you told me that you adopted me from your sister, but you didn't adopt mine? Are you just curious, or is it something else? Son, this Nancy mansion and all this property doesn't belong to your uncle. It belongs to your grandmother Nancy, and your mother Alice owns half of it. I don't want to die with the burden of having stolen someone's share. A Nancy Mansion. I wonder what that is. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't tell you about Sanjay. Let me tell you just a little bit about him. Um, he's a novelist. He is a short story author and he's a poet. He lives in Sydney. Uh, um, he says, when he's not frightening strangers with his writing, <laughs> he's most likely trying to I integrate some strange software applications in his office. And uh, just down there, you've got his website. And you've got a QR code as well if you want to go and visit it. So let's ask Carol straight away for instant reaction, please. Well, the the dialogue is very telling. Uh, as I just saw someone mention in the in the chat room, it's expositional, yeah. and I agree. I'm not sure the story started in the right place. Um, it, it's an interesting history, certainly not something that you don't find in people's families. Uh, but I think it might have been better if we'd been introduced to it in a different way. Mm. It, it's it's kind of a torturous, well, you know, Bob, sort of conversation yeah. that it, it, it doesn't really pull me in oh. emotionally and make me go, ooh, you know, he wants to go find out more about it. Yeah. I also was a little confused about whose point of view we were in. It, it almost feels like an omniscient point of view because we've got, we're jumping back and forth between what, uh, the protagonist and his mother is thinking and feeling and hmm. and that creates distance to a conversation like this a, a family secret this deep that she's held this long i would think maybe um a closer more intimate point of view would work better yeah yeah i couldn't agree more um let's um let's drop here in the middle of it now emma your reaction please your first reactions <laughs> Yeah, I would agree a lot with that. I mean, the things that I thought were good about it, I actually quite liked the opening paragraph. I felt that in those first few lines, um, I thought it was setting me up for a really um, interesting piece of writing. I, I felt I got a lot about both characters, you know, the son rushing home to the mother, the mother... I initially thought possibly a bit of a yeah. hypochondriac calling her son home. I quite liked that opening. I thought it was it was great. And that, yeah. that line, yeah, I'm still alive. You can just imagine a kind of real burdenous mother. I'm still alive. And I liked that. And I, and, and I thought the characterisation was great. I, I also agree about the dialogue. I thought mm. there was a massive, masses A of info dump in the dialogue. Mm. Um, and I thought mm. maybe Sanjay could play around a little bit with maybe some free and direct speech for his principal character. As Carol said, it was, it was the, once the dialogue kicked in, it was almost like a play script. You didn't really know yeah. who you were following. Absolutely. So I think some free and direct speech from him would be amazing. Um, uh, I also thought words like thus in dialogue were quite clunky. I don't think anyone uh, really talked about that. I'm the only person um, I know who uses formal. that. <laughs> no, exactly. Jacob so, Rees Mogg um, probably does too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite possibly. Uh, but yeah, I think, so I think for me it was the dialogue that needed a lot of work. Once yeah. Carol said about wondering if the story started in the right place, that then also made me think, oh yeah, she's, she's probably right. We could maybe have started this somewhere else. Yeah. But, but I, did, I did like that beginning beginning bit but and, and i thought there were lots of hooks there but because yeah. they came in this massive info dump they got lost and actually mm. if if they'd have been gently placed rather than 
thrown all together. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's the basis of a great story. I think this, this you know, I was thinking yes. of kind of Aaron Daffy Roy and sort of God of yeah. Small Things. You know, exactly. I was thinking about that kind of, that yeah. kind of novel. And I think great potential here. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, way. you, what you, as often happens actually, with, which is terrific guests. We always have great guests. Um, I, I have very little to add to that, actually. I, I totally agree. And I think the thing is, Sanjay, that dialogue is not your strong point. So why are you leading with something that's not strong? And if you don't, can't see it's not your strong point, then you need to, need to study that quite, quite a lot. I wrote down a little sentence that his mum said, there are some important things of which you are not yet aware I, uh, I can't hear anyone saying that at all, actually, except possibly in you know, 18th century dialogue. But it just doesn't... The it, it, dialogue is stilted. It's, it doesn't work. So, um, but like, um, like Emma, I actually think there's a really interesting idea there. Really interesting. So I'm going to be kind of encouraging. Emma, well, you've got four choices here in front of you. Right at the top, maximum. I mean, it's just like total rave. Um... One down from that, yeah, I'd turn the page, see so you see how it's going to go. Disengage is like turn the page, except a little bit on the negative side. Shred it. Doesn't happen much, but it has happened a little bit. So what are you going to go for? I, I'm going to go for turn the page because the page. I think there's enough, of, there's enough of a promise here of the story that I'm going to give the writing a little bit longer. Okay. But I would only give it, if that kind of dialogue continued yeah. for another couple of pages, then I think I, I would disengage. Oh, I think you're but being very I generous. I would give it another chance. I would give right. it a bit longer. You're going to give it a bit longer? Opening. Carol? Yeah, I'd give it a bit longer. I agree. I would turn the page and give them a, a, a bit of a chance here to, to pull me in. The thing is, you, you, you authors, you stick together. You know, this is <laughs> <you're> nice <laughs> to each other. That's you so encourage true. each other. You help each other. <laughs> It's up to a nasty agent like me to say, actually, I'm going to disengage because that dialogue does kill it for me. Sorry about that, Sanji, but that's how it is. Let's move on. I really liked it. It was like uh, Shakespeare set in the future. Like Shakespeare set in the future. And that was good writing. Oh, uh, oh my God! Oh, my God! <laughs> Look what you just did! <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what can happen on this show. And remember, you can quote our, our famous guests. Isn't that great? Uh, number two on the list is Jelly Kelly and the Little Visitor. It's a blank QR code there, so we haven't got a website there. This is from Samuel. And, as you might be able to tell from the title, it is children's. Uh, my work says Sam. I'm going to call you Sam. I hope that's right. My work features a lovable title character, Jelly Kelly, who is made entirely of a greenish, wobbly, see-through substance. He lives in a faraway world, which encourages the reader to use their imagination. Upon finding a small human girl enter his world, Jelly Kelly sets about finding out... Sets about finding out... Well, doesn't read too well. Where she came from and tries to help her not be misconceived as a scary monster by his townsfolk. OK, just about understood that. Along the way, they bond over games and take part in ancient quest. What can I tell you about Samuel? Samuel is a young, first-time writer. I believe in my character, says Samuel, and the story I've created. Admittedly, I'm not as polished or experienced, and this may reflect on my work, but I really need someone to see beyond that and focus on the story I'm trying to put across. I'm willing to listen to all the developmental ideas and happy to edit and change parts. The main point is that I have an honest, true, and much-needed story that needs to be told. And in fact, we have one of our finest to tell it. It's Rich. The first page. Lone Britain. No, it's By not. Sanjay. It's not. Agnihotri. Jelly Kelly and the Little Visitor by S. M. Giles. Read by Rich. Dear reader, I once had a very strange friend. He was big and odd looking. He had two large iron horns, two large black eyes, a mouth filled with four sharp long teeth, and, well, I can't really describe much else of him because there's not much else to say. When someone is made of the same substance all over their large, weird body, you run out of ways to describe it. You see, my friend was wobbly, like trifle, all over. He was green and see-through. Imagine him as one very large block of jelly. He had arms, legs, feet, and all the usual stuff. You probably have them on your body, but your body is made up of hard bone covered in soft skin. 
Although initially scary looking, you couldn't find a more kind, sweet-hearted, lovable character than my friend. His name was Jelly Kelly. He was seven foot tall the last time he was measured. This isn't a problem in his hometown of Wobbleton, as he is one of the smaller breeds of jelly people. Wobbleton is situated in the United Wibblelands, which is another world away from ours, and is a beautiful place. There are no modes of transport there, which means there is no air pollution. The night sky is the clearest sky, sprinkled with glittery stars. The rivers and lakes are the clearest, purest water there is. The water is so clear, you have to be physically standing in it and see it move to know that it is there. Scattered around this beautiful, untouched world are many different tribes of jelly people. The different tribes' appearances can vary hugely depending on their location. I have spent my whole life studying the jelly people, and I have met many of the different tribes, and some of them are so different you wouldn't even think they are jelly people. The jelly people from Flobford, for example, which is situated in the deserts of Antar, are almost a pearly translucent colouring from their long exposure to the sun. They are also the only tribe to have developed claws as a way of digging through the hot sand to create a small hole to stay cool in. A jelly person from the wild woods of Slumpland, though, can grow up to 11 feet tall and is almost brown in colour. This is so they can pretend to be like the ancient trees that surround them as they pass their time interacting with the tree folk there. Wobbleton, where Jelly Kelly and his greenish-coloured town folk reside, is much like the English countryside. Different shades of beautiful greens, with life springing up from every bush spread across untouched land as far as the eye can see. Jelly people have distinct advantages to being made out of wobbly, see-through substance that doesn't have much other uses. They can squeeze into the smallest spaces by changing the shape of their bodies, letting them slip through cracks and slide under doors. My friend, Jelly Kelly, often likes to store things inside his stomach like a natural pocket. He reaches his hands through his goo and deposits his possessions for safekeeping until he needs them. A jelly person can often also leave a slime trail wherever they go. This may not seem appealing, but they use it as a kind of tracking device. It's easy to follow and track down poor old confused Uncle Jelly Mary, who got lost in the woods once, when he leaves a trail of luminous green goo behind him. All in all, jelly people are very nimble and agile for their size, and they are very proud of their bodies. They speak the same language as you but they speak in rhyme. They do this as a way to keep themselves cheerful, as they hate feeling sad and will do anything to avoid it. Everything seems better in rhyme. Now, you may be sitting there in your cosy room thinking, jelly people sound fun, I'd love to hug one. I would love you to hug one too, just because it gives me hours of laughter and enjoyment to see a lovely young person like you floating around inside a seven-foot-tall walking trifle. Don't worry, the jelly person you choose to hug will always let you back out. Unless you choose to hug Jelly Jenkins, he's best avoided. Now you know a bit about my dear old friend Jelly Kelly and his race, I can begin relaying his story to you. So turn the page and let's get started. Yes, let's get started indeed. I'm feeling a bit wibbly. Um, and this, uh, Samuel, is where you want to get to today, hopefully. And as you'll see, maybe this is a, a org as well. It's a little mo omen, perhaps. Last week's one, you see, was another Samuel. So um, maybe, I don't know, maybe. Let's see. Terrific stuff happening in the chat room. Excellent reaction. If you're not watching live and if you are, um, you know, if you're not watching live, then you're watching recorded. That would be logical. You can just stop it. Just stop it there and just read what the chat room is saying. Enormous amounts of concentrated, uh, concentrated consents. So, Emma, let's come to you, please, for your first reactions. Are you feeling as wibbly as, as I am? I am feeling a little bit wibbly. I am ah, feeling very wibbly. He's got you, he's got you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this isn't my, obviously, the genre that I write in, but I do have a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. Ah. A 10-year-old who's a very keen reader and an 8-year-old who is uh, not a keen reader. Uh, I think what would concern me with this, I think it's a, it's a lovely idea, this kind of jelly the jelly character, and I love the inversion of the of the human character going into that world, and I think... 
you know, with so much in the press at the moment with, with refugees and about immigration, I think there's a lot that could be said for children in a story like this. I, I like the concept. Interesting, I haven't thought about that, yeah. Hmm. But I think... I think someone said this in the chat room, and this was the first thing I wrote down in big letters, what age I wrote at mm-hmm. the top of my pad. Because yeah, me too. Because the short sentences at the, begot- at the beginning read like a picture yeah. book, yeah. and yet some of the vocabulary later on was more like a 12 or 13 age, yeah. 12 or 13 age reader. So right. I think that needs to be looked at. Yeah. I also think, JK, again, mass, the little mass info dumps, mass info dump of, of information, and uh, lots of description of the place. I do think a lot of young readers would just switch off because there was just too much. And even the paragraph on the page, the aesthetically, mm-hmm. that huge amount of text to a young reader is, is really off-putting. They'll look at that mm-hmm. and think, oh, you know, they need shorter paragraphs, um, more action. We need, you know, and it, it, I know we kind of, I kind of chuckled at the end when he said, let's get started because I kind of had been feeling that for a while, you know. It, it, to me, it made, read more like a, an author's notes to themselves yeah, about yeah, yeah. how you know how, what this character was going to be like. I wanted yeah. to see the character, hear the character. I want some action. I want you know, and, and there was a, a couple of lighter moments of humour at the beginning, and I think we needed more of that too. That would have been lovely. Yeah, it's, I mean, the thing is, it's an extended joke. Unless there's a lot more stuff that happens very quickly, then I'm I'm put after three or four pages. You know, I mean, yeah. actually, even even on the first page, Samuel, um, the thing that st- stood out for me was Antar, because you'd been making wibbly wobbly puns for place names and people's names and everything. But Antar, suddenly we got something that wasn't a joke anymore. And I, all that said to me was, you've kind of run out of jelly jokes. Actually, I would, I, if if this is to work, I would not want a lot more story and not just an emphasis on. Look, I've got a got a protagonist who's all kind of seven foot tall and all wibbly wobbly. Well, that's not going to sustain a story. You need more than that. Um, anyway, I'm getting ahead of things, Carol. I can't add much to that. I agree. The first thing I wrote down as well was what age is this targeted to? Because yeah. It wasn't reading like a children's book. It was reading more like a middle grade book or even um, we used to have books specifically for the junior high ages, which was grades yeah. seven, eight, and nine. So roughly 13, yeah. 14, 15 year olds. And um, I, I agree with, with everything Emma said. The paragraphs were too big. There was there was way too much description at the beginning. I just, I wanted to, I wanted to get into the world. I wanted to get into the character. I also was pulled out when he said something about uh, there was no air pollution because there were no modes of transportation. Uh, Air pollution comes from a lot more than modes of transportation. Horse and buggy can be a a mode of transportation and that's not going to pollute produce air pollution so i i know it's a nitpicky little thing but you got to be careful especially if you're writing a children's book if you're going to make statements like that that are not yeah. grounded in fact because you're also trying to teach them something and you know we, we don't want to yeah. teach them wrong things good grief <laughs> good grief <laughs> leave little children astray us oh my goodness gracious no. <laughs> uh all right so um, emma t- take a view please oh i don't want to say i Go to be on. honest, I, I think be really, honest. I think I would disengage, I would disengage just because just too much too much description, um, mm. and I think I'd kind of you know, even if I was reading this to my children, I'd kind of go yeah, I think we need something mm. a bit more exciting. Yeah, and Carol, a great I concept. Agree. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, agree. I think I'm we're afraid all, I would disengage. Yeah, I think we're all going to disengage on that, Samuel. Yeah. Um, you are incredibly enthusiastic, actually. And, you know, I really appreciated your, your sort of biographical note, which is quite long, and I'm not reading all of it by any means, but um, I love your enthusiasm. And you are a self-described very young writer, and, you know, writing is a game that usually almost always gets better as you get older, unlike many other things in life. So, you know, you're right at the beginning of your, your writing career. Um, you've told me how absolutely committed and obsessed you are to this story, and I understand that. Um, and you shouldn't really write anything unless you are obsessed and, and committed to it. But you also, in my view, if I may give you a little advice, my feeling is put it to one side. Just put it to one side. This is always, it's always good advice. Um, and it, you can tell me it's good advice because the writer never wants to do it. They say, no, 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 I got another three months, another six months, and I'll crack it. And actually, that's exactly the right time. 
for you just to, to stop. And I've, I've got a writer with my clients who will literally physically wrap the manuscript up, wrap it up and tie it with a little pink bow. And then they will put it in, in a bottom drawer somewhere and they will not touch it again. Six months. And then they'll bring it out and they'll see it with completely fresh eyes. At that point, you are able then to take a decision as to whether you want to spend, it, spend more time, invest more of your precious time on it, or whether it's taken you as far as you um, can go with that particular manuscript and it's time to, to move on and, and learn new things. And I think possibly you would choose the latter. But I, I would say just disengage from... Uh, well, we're all disengaging. Disengage from that manuscript at this point. Do something else, then come back to it six months' time and see what you think. We're looking for a partner, not just anyone. Pop-Up Submissions is growing. Grow with us. Let's talk. So we now move from children's to an interesting... Interesting submission that is self-described literary fiction, which um, I like to know what Emma thinks about this when we've we've read it, because she was saying something that was quite close to my heart earlier on about literary fiction. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is from Matthew, and this is Matthew's blurb. When Margot Stroud inherits great property, she spurns her devoted lover and her child for a life of hedonistic escapism. Leaving small town Brussels behind, she travels the world and falls in with a sexually ambiguous set of the young and moneyed, seeking decadence in all of its uncompromised forms. Matthew McLaughlin's debut novel, shortlisted for the Fresher Prize, carries the reader through the temptations of the modern world in a harrowing portrayal of obsessive love and vanquished hope. And I should tell you a little bit about Matthew. Um, he's a young lawyer and actor. He lives in London. He studied at Cambridge and King's College London and previously worked for The Week magazine. A magazine well known, I think, to everyone in the UK. And we have Emily to read this for us. The first page. The Idol of the Decadence by Matthew McLaughlin, read by Emily. It's Austrian. High Art Nouveau or Jugendstyle. Probably secessionist. The pewter is silver plated. It's listed in the catalogue for 1906. Or so they say. The carafe was a deep green, crystal test tube set in silver whiplash curves with a peak like an elf's ear for a handle. At its base was the sensuous profile of a woman with medusa hair pinned back by the petals of a flower. It was a decadent, noisome thing being peered at by a young woman whose profile mirrored that in set in the silver. It's ghastly and it's mind festing, she said. Little to know that this sham treasure would administer the potion which ruptured her colon, splintered her kidneys and punctured her stomach like a steam piston through paper. Her companion, a lawyer with tortoise-shell glasses, put out his hands flippantly. It's yours, he said. You're meeting him tonight? At eight o'clock. Where are you meeting him? asked the lawyer. At the Salome, she paused. I think I liked him. Make sure things run smoothly. The young woman nodded, catching the lawyer's raised eyebrows and warning eyes. She glanced around the room, whose treasures gleamed red and green and gold. The room was a severe cuboid, as though a square piston had thrust it in place. It was the long and thin entrance hall of a big house. In the centre was a simple white table upon which the carafe stood, and beside which the lawyer was standing. He was opposite the young woman, whose eyes darted nonchalantly around walls leaden with red tiles, the mosaics and frescoes of celebrated artists, and pictures of things like full-lipped nubiles being seduced by sphinxes. The treasures of the house, the palais, or so the newspapers called it, did not end in the entrance hall, but seeped into every crevice, every doorway and nook, every centimetre almost, thought through, designed and commissioned by a celebrated figure, every gleaming egg cup written up as a masterpiece of contemporary design, of artistic skill rivalling a beauty only nature commanded. It was set back from a Brussels boulevard and had survived the war by a miracle. The man who commissioned it, the young woman's great-grandfather, and a nationalist, signed an accord with the local authorities in the twenties and so secured its fate. Wartime had not destroyed the house. It was seized from one invader to another and, during the occupation, the Allies agreed to disagree to the extent that the Twenties Accord was accepted and enforced. I'll make it go smoothly, she said. 
but this is tedious. The lawyer opened a leather case by his side and shuffled some documents towards the girl. Never mind about that, he said, slowly and deliberately sliding a pen across the table to her. His hands were soft and she saw the clipped nails of his index and forefinger as the pen came towards her. This is not just for your future, remember, but a future for posterity itself, he said. Posterity? The young woman scoffed. She became imperious. I know exactly what I'm doing, Feston. This is for me. She quickly picked up the pen, oiled and warm from the lawyer's hand, pulled out the last page from the pile and signed Margot Stroud in a flourish at the bottom, setting the date by its side. And just like that, she said, have I become an heiress like every girl dreams? Have I settled something that no one thought could be settled? I suppose you have, came the reply, so long as you play your part with him tonight. That's my business. Now see about the newspapers. Miss Stroud, let me know when it's finished. Hmm. Um... Interesting reactions going on in the chat room there. Let me just uh, remind you that it's not too early, actually, to start your vote. We've got uh, at least two more submissions after this. But, yeah, start voting now. And that live vote is something that everyone can take part in. Wherever you are, latopia.com slash vote. No vote yet. That will change very soon. Let's ask... Let's not ask... <laughs> yeah, pushing the wrong buttons today. <gasps> Can't believe it. <coughs> ah, Carol. Carol, give us a reaction. Well, I'm not sure what's going on. At first, I thought it was a story about the craft. And then I thought it was a story about the house. There was a lot of description. And then she's signing a piece of paper. She is. I think without the blurb, I would have been a little lost. You know, the writing is fine. Uh, it, nice description. It flows well. I'm, it, I'm still not sure about point of view, but I tend to get kind of hung up on that. I, I don't, mm. I don't enjoy stories written in omniscient point of view. So no, I totally agree. Sometimes I, yeah. Sometimes I just shouldn't comment on it because a lot of people write that no, way. No, you should. You should. Just, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not quite sure what's going on. I'm not quite sure where this story has started and where we're heading. Okay. Okay. Good reaction there. I'd like to know what you think, Emma. Please. Right. Okay. Well, when I read, when we we sort of heard the blurb at the beginning, I was quite excited because I thought, uh, firstly, because I recently read Picture of Dorian Gray for the first time. It's one of yeah. the classics that somehow passed yeah. me by, yeah. and so that kind of evoked that kind of sense with me. Um, also, the miniaturist Jesse Burton. I started yeah. to think of that book. And also, I was thinking, oh, with the whole Jeffrey Epstein thing going on at the moment, <laughs> and what's yeah. the name of it? I was thinking it could yeah. almost be a, yeah. yeah. So I was quite quite excited. I thought it was good, and I agree with Carol. I thought there's some beautiful writing in there, some lovely description. Some of it for me was overly descriptive, and I felt some of it really needed to be edited because it, it needed to earn its place. Mm -hmm. And that description of the guy's fingernails, I, I couldn't quite work out the relevance of that. Um, and then there was the odd sentence like the room was a severe cuboid, which kind of jarred a little bit. So I think there needs some editing to be done there. But Talk about jarring. What did the colon yeah, thing were. did the colon thing jump out at you? Yes. It jumped out at me. That was odd as well. I couldn't I'm sorry, quite odd, work it? out. Yeah. 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 But I thought there was some lovely sensual stuff. Like at the beginning yeah, it was so. quite decadent yeah. and exciting. Yeah, yeah. So I definitely think this writer has some skill with language. It just mm. needs some editing, I think. So I thought that was good. Mm. Um, yeah, but I, 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 yeah, so I think there's real potential here, real potential, but I also got lost. I kind yeah. of got confused what was okay. going on. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I agree. Um, I'm keener on it than, than Carol. I like, I like the writing. I like, I like your writing, Matthew. Um, there's a, there's a feeling of, uh, it's interesting. We're sort of reaching back or sometimes very contemporary for, uh, for examples, but there's a slight touch here of Scott Fitzgerald for me. Actually, mm. I don't. I don't know where, who exactly we're following, but I assume we're following the female. Um, so, my next sort of question to myself after that was: Is this the, is this the right book for the time? And you've just said it is because of the Jeffrey Epstein thing. That's possible, actually. It's quite possible. But then I'd got the the Scott Fitzgerald sort of metaphor comparison in my in my head, and I was thinking, well, actually. In fact, Scott Fitzgerald didn't really work first time round. It took it took it took a war to make Scott Fitzgerald a bestseller, but um, he kind of wrote wealth porn actually, 
wasn't it that, that famous quotation between him and uh, Hemingway? Mm-hmm. You know, the rich are different from us. And Hemingway says, yeah, they've just got more money. But Scott Fitzgerald <laughs> was always kind of in love with that, you know, with the, the, the Gilded Age. So I don't know whether that's the right feeling of the time at the moment. I just wonder whether this is a book that's, that's not in touch with the zeitgeist. Or, alternatively, it might be. It might well be in touch, um, as, you, as you say, Emma. So I'm going for Turn the Page. What would you say, Carol? I would give it a few more pages. I would turn the page, definitely. And how about you? Yeah, I'm a strong turn the page for this. Strong book. turn, yeah, I strong page. So. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. I think that's all. That's that's all. I think you got a result there, Matthew. Actually, now before we move on to our next submission, I want to have a word with you, young Emma, please, oh, <clears throat> about your 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 book, what you've just published. Actually, you haven't just published oh, no. it. Who, who's published it? So it's published by Bookature, who are a digital imprint uh, of Hachette. Yeah, there it is. There it is. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> book. Nice to see <laughs> you. <laughs> so this is okay. So this is an all digital uh, uh, publisher. It, it, well, you can buy a print on demand paperback on Amazon, but yeah, right. the main thrust is digital. Yes. And you've been with them for several of your titles now, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, so this is my fourth book with them. Um, yeah. It's a slight genre change for me. Uh, my first three were more on the kind of humorous. Uh, the humorous angle, but a lot of the reviewers, and this is possibly quite interesting for some of your writers listening in, that a lot of, although I believed I was writing humorous fiction, a lot of the the reviewers, the part that they engaged with were the the sadder, more emotional strands within my stories. So, yeah, so for this deal, this is the first one in a second uh, publishing deal for me with Bookature, and my editor and I spoke at length and decided that we were going to take the plunge and, and go a bit more kind of focused, you know, pull back on the humour a little bit. I mean, it's still, uh, there's still some light yeah. moments, but pull back on that and really focus on the more emotional side. But it, it's still about a mother. And okay, all so my looking, at your, uh, looking at your Amazon page, it desperately wants me to sign in. No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to sign <laughs> in. Show everybody my password. <laughs> password <laughs> one, one, two, three, four. Um, you've got some amazing reviews. Yeah, it's incredible. Really? I, I, and yeah. I mean, yeah, you've either got incredible. a lot of friends <laughs> well, I do have who will do anything for you, or you've, you've really got some, some readers there whose hearts yeah. you've touched. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, and I've had lots of personal messages from people as well, which, which is incredible because yeah. if you feel, you know, if something that you've written moves somebody else, particularly a lot of the people that have contacted me, you know, personally have been people with children that have had similar they've had similar parenting experiences to Sarah with Ruby in my story. And that's been very humbling to feel that I've been able to, I mean, I did do a lot of research. I spoke to a lot of mothers um, who had lived through this kind of experience when your child is not hitting the milestones and you have to come to realize that they're going to, you know, need different parenting or or so on. And I, and and I want to emphasize, it's not really a story about autism or about special needs. It's a story about a mother and mm. how a mother comes to terms with that and, mm. and realises that. So we don't follow Ruby through her through any kind of medical or diagnosis or anything really. We were just at the beginnings, but it's it's how Sarah processes that and, and how she... Well, I don't want to say too much, but yes. No, no, I'm almost mother. about to shut you up, actually. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we, what, we, what we need to do here, we, we publishing professionals, and we need to sell the sizzle. But, you know, we don't we don't want to give away too much of the story because no, no, otherwise, no. <laughs> you know, otherwise the punters won't buy it. But, uh, <laughs> but let me just ask you one, one, one final question. So how did you pick, because I've, I've, I've looked at the previous books you've written, and clearly there is a progression here. How did you pick this topic? Um, I think I'm a teacher, so I have, you know, I deal with children of all different um, abilities and needs, and also uh, uh, my, I have uh, my nephew is autistic, and I have, uh, you know, I know other, uh, I've got good friends, and also my first novel, The Undercover Mother, really was came from my own experience having a child and feeling like yeah. I'd been run over by a flame train, and it really, I kind of felt how, you know, how much more how different would that be if your child had other needs as well? And and yeah. that's kind yeah. of where it came from, I guess. Yeah. And the commitment, the total wholehearted commitment that... Yeah, and, and the fact of just having yeah. to, 
you know, to, to, to look at things differently. And, mm. and it's, it's re- I, I'm, I'm a real passionate believer in friendship and support and not judging one another. It's, it's kind of my mantra on my, on my blog page. Oh, so, we've just um, seen your blog. Yeah. We've just seen your blog. One final question. Yes. Are you ready for this? Well, yeah, I think. Who is Keith Houghton and what does he mean to you? Oh, so Keith Houghton is, was my English teacher, took me through GCSEs. He also um, managed our public speaking team. He did school plays. He's incredible. He is a real, in my, lo- in my town, uh, he was an English teacher at my uh, secondary school, just a regular comprehensive for decades. And everybody remembers him. He's a huge character. And I was, he has, I sent him one of every of my books and he actually came. He hasn't been in very great health, but he actually came to my book launch on Friday, which was amazing. Absolutely and amazing. He's a so teacher who changed the course of your life. Absolutely. An, an inspiration. An inspiration. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Two more submissions. Lose your inhibitions and find your voice in Ladopia's Flash Club. Every month, a new micro-writing challenge designed to get your creative juices really flowing. Hone your writing skills while you're having fun. Another membership benefit from Litopia. Check it out now. Yes, indeed, you must do. Absolutely without without any fear at all. Uh, this is The Mirror. This is New Age slash adult fantasy murder mystery. That's quite a genre there, Alan. You've bent a few genres there to your liking. I hope it's to our liking too. This is your blurb. The Mirror is a fast-paced, man-from-uncle style murder mystery with intricate plot twists, murderous warriors, mythological monsters and gods. It is a 128,500-word novel inspired by J. Christoph, Lainey Taylor and Lee Bardugo. For those who love the dark and dreamy and aren't afraid to be immersed in a little expletive humour and graphic imagery. The first 700 words of the second chapter introduce the main character. Ooh, this is not blurb, is it? (laughs) Chapter one is the murder and there's a prologue, which is a setup for the flashbacks. Oh, right, I'll forgive you all that, Alan, because you're young. I know how old you are, actually. But I'm not going to tell everyone. Everyone, everyone who sends a submission pretty much sends their age in. And it's kind of useful to know, but I'm not going to broadcast that because sometimes it's like, oh, I am 80. And, I, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, well, we, I don't think we take submissions from anyone under 21, but we certainly have had 21 year olds. So, uh, about Ellen, uh, freelance uh, writer with a degree in graphic design illustration. When she's not writing, she works as a graphic designer in the most. Um, binge watches movies, TV series, and occasionally goes to the beach or goes sailing if she's feeling really adventurous for her. Writing is an escape. She enjoys the deep, dark, and gruesome combined with mythology, romance, and emotional turmoil. Oh, and plot twists. Epic plot twists, of which her novel, The Mirror, has many. All right, you're setting us up there, hopefully for a whole world of pleasure delivered to us by Rich. The first page. The Mirror by Ellen, read by Rich. Introduction. Death is darkness. Not the comforting darkness of night, nor a tomb suffocating black, buried beneath the earth, crushed beneath the soil. Death is the darkness of nothing, disappearing into oblivion. Chapter 2. A woman shrouded in white emerged from the mouth of a desolate street, boots unnaturally silent as she crossed the frozen pavement. She paused a moment, curious, and watched the scant crowd gather before her gallery. Caution tape obstructed the entrance, and a collection of steel letters gleamed above it, naming the gallery, The Mirror. The woman lifted a hand to her scarf, smoothing the ruffles of fabric which coiled tightly around her head as a series of restless shivers prickled over her concealed scalp. The sensation crept down her spine, raising her skin in delicate mounds beneath the wool of her billowing clothes. She sucked in a breath, the winter air frigid in her lungs, her fingers curling into softly clenched fists as she willed the prickling to stop. Across the street, the mirror gallery perched like a cut diamond amongst sand, its glass facade supporting four stories of looming, embellished stone, split by gleaming windows and balustrades of twisted iron. The neighbouring buildings stood sentinel, near perfect duplicates, their stone features forever guarding as life spilled through time. 
A single drop of water fell from the leaden sky, splattering across the woman's cheek. She glanced at the swollen, threatening clouds, golden eyes flashing, and wiped the liquid from her skin. The ghost of a frown curved her lips as she stepped forward, weaving through the murmuring crowd like wind through rustling leaves. Keeping her silence, she slipped beneath the caution tape, choosing a section which remained unmanned, and strode to the gallery entrance. She straightened her shoulders, chin elevated in defiance, glinting gaze pinned on the officer standing guard. The officer met her stare, pale scars and tribal tattoos shimmering on a face as dark as midnight. I assume you're Miss Adelinda Vale? The woman nodded, faintly raising a brow as she admired the swirling patterns of the officer's tattoos before peering at the gallery's entrance. Its curtains had been lowered behind the glass, shielding the chaos inside. The officer narrowed her unusual eyes, her right gilded amethyst, her left a depthless coffee. My name is Tsalika. She assessed the scarf binding Adelinda's head, the woolen cloak flowing over her shoulders. I was asked to escort you inside. I don't need an escort. Adelinda flicked a hand dismissively and shifted to step around the towering woman. Tsalika pursed her lips, nostrils flaring. She held out an arm, the movement precise, indisputable, barring Adelinda's path. I wasn't asking. Adelinda stopped herself as her hand began to reach for her scarf, aching to placate the prickling as it sent another shiver across her shoulders. She settled for brushing her fingers across her brow, the tips trailing down her cheek before falling to her side. Lead the way, then. Salika shoved the door open, holding it just long enough for Adelinda to slip inside. It took a few breaths for Adelinda's eyes to adjust to the subdued light. The gallery echoed with countless footsteps, with the hushed murmurs of officers and forensics, the quiet sniffs which followed tears. Adelinda! Adelinda frowned, responding involuntarily to the shrill, lilting voice and fighting to ignore the mounds rising on her arms as she strode towards the copper-eyed woman with fiery ginger hair. Ivette, why are there so many... Adelinda's murmur of citrus and syrup trailed into nothing as her gaze landed on her marble sculpture, poised in the centre of the room. The sculpted dancer seemed about to swoon, arms elegantly extended, unseeing eyes gazing eternally up, up towards the roof, painted a pale, bleaching white, up towards a woman, hanging silent, lifeless, murdered. Uh oh, <laughs> this is going to be trouble. How does that make you feel, then, Emma? I I love this. I want more. I don't. I don't want it to stop. I want it to keep going. Beautiful description. Beautiful. Loved the white and dark, and that was kind of echoed all the way through. Um, I mean, there's a lot of description in here. Like, this is a really interesting comparison with the one we mm -hmm. talked about earlier with too much description, because there's a ton of description in here, but. It's crafted, so you've still got oodles of conflict. You've got the co conflict tape, you know, sorry, the um, caution tape, what's going on there. You've got the prickling in her skin, what's that? You know, the officer, no, I, you know, I am taking you in, so why, you know, why is she going in? But, you know, I've got so many questions. So I think this knocks it out of the park. I think I, I'm a bit, when I re heard the, the blurb at the beginning, yeah. I thought, I'm going to hate this. This is yeah. too much going on. 128,000 yeah. words is way yeah. too long. It's, it's not a great blurb, and it's not actually relevant terrible to the manuscript, blurb. really, no. Yeah, terrible blurb, but beautiful writing. Love the description, love the character. Exciting, really exciting. I, I, right. I love this. Well, I love right. Alan, uh, hey, Alan, I think things are going <laughs> to go well for you, at least as far as I'm concerned. Let's see what Carol thinks. Hmm. <laughs> That doesn't sound good. I, well, it, it, there, there are just it, it's too much. The description is too, too much. There, there's there are two and three adjectives for every single noun in there, and I'm getting I, I'm getting too bogged down in trying to picture what she's writing, and instead of moving forward with the sentences and moving forward with the story. Um, yes, it's beautiful description. I've never seen anyone describe eyes that way before but it's, mm. it's a really neat way to do it murmur of citrus and syrup I, i've never seen that before mm. 
Um, I strongly suggest this writer, though, learn how to use apostrophes. There were a couple of instances in yeah. there where it was in the wrong place. And this grammar Nazi well. here, I'm yeah. sorry, it, it kind yeah. of pulled me right out. But I just, it, 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 it's, I think there's a really great story underneath here. I really do. I just think she could cut the adjectives easily in half and could move this forward a little bit. It, it took yeah, 700 I think a lot of people words to that. get her... Well, it took 700 words to get her from the sidewalk into the building. And exactly. I think we exactly. could have done it in yeah. 50. Yeah, we could have done and, it. And still had the great description. Yeah. So Richard said some interesting things. I don't know if you've been following the, uh, the chat room. Alan, you must do. It's what we pay you for. No, we, we don't pay you. Um, Richard said some very interesting things. So Rich was your reader today. And very lucky you are to get Rich. Um, Rich says, I definitely turn the page. I love the style, even though it was heavy-handed at times. And before that, he was going on melodrama. Yeah, I think you are guilty of melodrama on that. And I totally agree with, with Carol <laughs> that um, it, it took too long to get where we got to. However, however, um, all those criticisms, I think, are completely valid. Um, it was a nice shock at the end. I like that. That worked for me. Mm -hmm. And when you get something like that working, I I would take the view, yeah, the rest of it needs fixing. It's got to be faster. Take out take out the melodrama, but that can be done. But if the author actually knows how to deliver um, a twist, and she says she does, she says epic plot twists. <laughs> if you know you can do that, if you can really do that, that is a major major thing. So that's definitely got my attention. What would you say in that case, Emma? I'm going to stick my neck out and disagree with both of you, and I'm going to say you got me. Oh, I'm really it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were. I have my finger ready and poised. Congratulations, <laughs> Alan. You've got. We don't always have one of those on, on a show, but you've, no. you've definitely got. Well, you've got one of our, our panellists. Uh, Carol, what are you going to say? Well, it, it started in Chapter 2. I, I would really would have loved to see what Chapter 1 was. That's the problem. That's the problem. Even though she got us, you know, she got us in Chapter yeah. 2. And yes, it was a great yeah. twist at the end there. Yeah. I, that's not where I start reading a book. I don't open no. a book and start reading it at Chapter 2. I read it at yeah. Chapter 1. Yeah. So with that being yeah. said, I would turn the page back because I want to see what Chapter 1 said. The big problem, according to the, the blurb that was a synopsis that was a few other things as well, is that Chapter 1 actually took the sting out of Chapter 2 because Chapter 1 was the murder. So by the time... So, you know, Ellen kind of knows that and she didn't let, let us see Chapter 1 because I think she wanted us to get the, the full impact uh, of the end of Chapter 2. But however, having had Chapter 1, knowing there's a dead body dangling around somewhere, there's no impact in Chapter 2. So, you know, that, that needs some, some serious work, I think. However, the, what, you know, what we can only judge what we've seen, and what we've seen, I, I think, is good. So, um, yeah, thank you, Alan. And isn't it great when, when we do get one of those firework displays? Um, hopefully you're voting hard, um, but don't vote to your exhaustion point because we do have one more submission. See this? It's called a QR code. Scan it with your phone. It'll take you straight to the website we're talking about. Yeah, and this is from Kevin. And it's got an interesting name. I don't even know if this is a made-up word. I think it might be, actually. Transilience. I've never heard of that word before. I fully admit it. I'm ignorant. It's transilience. It's science fiction, comma, hard-boiled detective. Oh, I always like one of those, please. Three and a half minutes. Daniel Helmquist is a private investigator in New London, the only city on Mars. He's good at what he does, but people aren't exactly lining up to hire his services. When two big cases land in his lap at once, he makes the mistake of believing his fortunes are about to change. What began as a chance to earn some easy money becomes a series of lies, cat and mouse games, and a chase that leads him through the streets of New London and out onto the surface of Mars itself. Let me tell you about Kevin. Kevin is a native of Detroit, who met a girl in Scotland, and now resides in the arboreal splendour of the Swedish hinterlands. He has been a great many things in his life, <laughs> says Kevin, none of which relate to his, uh, his academic pursuit of the Visigoths. How interesting. I didn't know they liked to be pursued academically. I thought it was a bit more physical. 
In Kevin's free time, he, uh, free time, he enjoys cooking, brewing beer, playing video games and standing in the garden, pretending to be useful. Transilience is his debut novel and has, he's got another novel, Sanzaru Killer, currently in a funding campaign with UK publisher Unbound. Interesting idea. Even more interesting, I think, will be to hear Robert read your first 700 words. The first page. Transilience by Kevin Bragg. Read by Robert Derry. New London, Mars. The Third Street Lounge is a swanky barn in the city's hellhole. The industrial manufacturing district. The owner, Curtis, transformed an abandoned cube of building into a classy gin joint with a stage for swinging bands, a dance floor for the uninhibited, an island bar in the centre of the room for the thirsty, small tables near the stage for the enthusiastic, and cosy booths along the wall for the intimate. Imported wood and art deco comprise the majority of the decor. Why Kurt chose the IM, how he paid for the place, or the renovations, are beyond me. I've never asked, because I don't care. Anywhere else in New London, the Third Street Lounge would be packed every weekday night and have a line around the block on weekends. Anywhere else in this city, bands would be begging to get a gig. Instead, the stage has never seen a live act and the only people lining up are the factory workers who go to the bar instead of home at the end of their shifts. I had my usual booth along the wall near the dance floor and was kept company by the remnants of a gin and tonic. Baseball highlights streamed on my MIX-12. If I hadn't been so oblivious to the world around me, I'd have seen her walk in, looking out of place in this joint as a herd of elephants on the Elysium Plantania. I only glanced up when I heard my name and caught a glimpse of the one person who could send me through the wormhole. At that moment, flight became impossible. Instead, I sat, rooted in my booth, and gaped like a fool at a woman who'd have made the judgment of Paris infinitely harder. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those poor saps instantly smitten by any dame that crosses my path. There are plenty of good-looking women in New London, but not like her. She possessed the kind of class only the truly beautiful enjoy, the very image of a new-look model, complete with an Arden-style jacket. The deep forest-green tones of the fabric matched the shade of her eyes. A blonde pixie cut framed a determined jaw, angular cheekbones, and a perfectly shaped nose. As the mystery woman glided towards me, her expression radiated contempt. I guess I couldn't blame her. Instead of sitting in my office, I was entrenched in a booth in New London's very own industrial nightmare, watching sports highlights and clutching a near-empty highball glass. Despite what I might say on the subject, first impressions matter. The thought of being viewed as some common wino stung like a punch to the gut. I extracted myself from my spot and rose to greet her. She checked me out again, this time head to toe. Fortunately, my pressed wool suit and tidy haircut stood in contrast to the other patrons of the bar. Add that to my 185 centis of fighting fitness, and I almost made inroads. A slight smile implied a minor success. You are Daniel Helmkvist? she asked, with a girlish voice that betrayed the smooth, silvery tone I had already conjured in my mind. I am. Would you care to take a... Would you care to sit? And may I take your coat? She arched a pencil-thin eyebrow. Take my coat? Yeah, you know. Help you out of it and hang it up. She turned her back to me. A guy who takes a lady's coat? What century did you step out of? She couldn't see my shrug or lopsided grin. I descend from a long line of Helmkvist who put a premium on politeness. Polite? What a rarity these days. She replied as I slid off her cashmere trench coat to reveal shapely shoulders and arms of flawless alabaster. A coat hanger attached to the booth gave me the option to do more than just toss it onto the bench seat. Unexpectedly, she sat down in the exact spot I had vacated only seconds ago. The confusion killed the moment of witty banter I had been enjoying with this stranger. Okay, and what happens next? One wonders. Uh, terrific uh, comments on the chat room. I don't know if you've been following them as... Um as Robert's been reading, but Katie Sal says, I like a good seedy bar, but my husband and one. 
<laughs> and Katie Sale also, also said Raymond Chandler meets Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke, which I think is probably just about right. Now, let me just remind you that the vote is happening. Look, that this is where it is, live from Baker Street. Um, the Isle of the Decadence has got 60% right now. The Mirror, 40%. Those are the only two currently the people are voting on, but obviously they haven't had the full panel plea of our complete uh, uh, five roster of submissions yet. So... That is going to change. That will definitely change. Emma, your reactions, please. Okay, well, I think this writer's clearly a talented writer. You know, he can clearly write. He can clearly write description. Again, I mean, there was some really lovely bits. I loved a dance floor for the uninhibited. That sounds like my kind of play. And I thought that whole section was really lovely. That's almost the whole of Essex, actually, isn't it? Let's be honest. Well, it is. It is. Grey's on a Friday night. That is. That is. But, um... uh, I did feel that almost at that point we then needed to get the dialogue. Like it was, yeah. that was probably yeah. enough. It was yeah. good, and then it carried on and carried on. So it, it, I think it really needs to cut that bit down. Yeah, it needs some dialogue. It needs something happening. Um, when the dialogue did happen again, it was just a bit too slow for me. And and as a woman, I don't. The minute I read, um, she had arms of flawless alabaster. I'm turning off. Mm. Because to me, sorry, what you, you know, got against alabaster? <laughs> Venus yeah. to me, like sort of just, hanging limply. What, what, what? <laughs> I just think any kind of stereotypical description of a woman's physical appearance. Oh. I think only when you're writing as a man, you have to get it right. Well, this is tough guy and stuff. This is t- I mean, you, you therefore you're, you're throwing out the whole collective works of Raymond Chandler, then, aren't you? Really, that's the problem. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. Mm. I mean, I don't. It's not what I would read, possibly. But no, yeah, I, I just. Not. Yeah, I, I guess, mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, the description was good. And I, I love the idea of the setting. I did, someone wrote at the bottom, I, I think, was it Robert wrote at the bottom, yeah. that we needed more of the Mars setting because otherwise, yeah. you know, there was only a little reference to that. We needed more of that maybe. But the, the, the biggest thing was, yes, you are, you are clearly a writer, you can clearly write, but we need to chop that chop that description down yeah. and have the dialogue a little bit more realistic. Yeah, yeah. We are kind of dealing with stereotypes of Chandler. I mean, people have done this for decades since Chandler, of course, and Chandler yeah. probably is still the best at it. But it's nice It's nice to deal. I mean, you've got to deal with stereotypes if you're writing tough guy, Chandler-esque fiction, but then also in this day and age, it's nice to break those stereotypes too. So have a mm-hmm. little bit of fun in, in that direction if you can. What did you think mm-hmm. there, Carol? I totally agree. You know, if you're going to do a hard boiled and you're going to channel Raymond Chandler, that's great because he is the master at it. But you have to take into account how people feel today. You have to take Mm -hmm. into account those sensitivities. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I -hmm. liked the voice in this one. I liked the pared down description. Um, it, it wasn't over the top for me. I didn't really understand, like I think it was Robert said in the chat room, what is the point of the Mars setting? This could have been in any bar, it anywhere could have been. on Earth. Yeah, it could have been. I, you know, it, yeah. it, I think I'm yeah. the one that made the comment in there about of yeah. all the gin joints in all the world, because that's yeah. what it reminded me of. I, I was thinking of Casablanca as, as, as he was reading yeah. this, which is fine. I mean, that's great. You can certainly use that setting, but it didn't feel very modern. It certainly didn't feel futuristic. I mean, we're yeah. along way from being able to live on Mars it, and it just it doesn't have that feel to it I, I think it, this might be going somewhere this is a talented writer I would just I would like to see him be a little more sensitive to some of the comments about women and maybe use this setting and make it a little bit different because this could have been written anywhere on earth fair enough just Good. feels a bit dated Good honest reaction there so in that case Carol carrying on with you uh, what are you going to go for on this well, I'll give it a few more pages. I'll turn the page. I, I wouldn't disengage me. from this because I love hard-boiled detective stories. So I, I would, yeah, I would too. turn the page to see me where too. this went. Yeah, me too. I hope it's not going to be too derivative, though. Uh, Emma. Yeah, I agree. The quality of the writing would make me turn the page, but I'd want, I'd want something extra to keep me turning the pages. Fair enough. Okay, now we've got to that time of the show, which is basically the end, actually, um, when I'm going to give our uh, wonderful panellists, hard-working panellists, actually, because no one sees the submissions before, so they are reacting just in the same way as the chat room is reacting in real time. They're seeing everything, and you're getting their reaction honest, straightforward, straight off the top of their head, which is the best way. Uh, I'm going to give them just a moment or two to think which one they're going to pick as the submission of the week. And I think it's going to be quite difficult this week. Um, so let me just run down things from the top. Sanjay Centre's Lone Britain. That's historical fiction. 
Um, and we, we, we liked the idea there, but we didn't much go for your dialogue, actually. Samuel sent us Jelly Kelly and the Little Visitor, and we all went a bit wibbly-wobbly on that. Um, then we had, from Matthew, The Idol of the Decadence. I think <clears throat> you got um, good reaction. You got a good reaction there, Matthew, uh, from everyone on that, actually. We thought it was measured, controlled writing. Ellen sent us something that got the best single reaction of the whole show today. So you must be well chuffed with that. And then finally, Kevin sent us Tough Guy Hard Boiled Fiction with a twist, um, shaken but not stirred, on Mars. So that's what we had this week. And now I'm going to ask our special guest which one she's going to pick. Well, I think it's probably quite obvious from the fireworks. I am going to go with the mirror, Ellen Hunt's The Mirror, because mm. I actually found that quite exciting and I feel she's she's really got something she could work yes. with there. Yes. Well, I think that's no surprise, actually. Uh, yeah, we, we saw you like the blue touch paper. <laughs> My God, that was quite, quite, a, quite a showing. But Carol, what are you going to go for? I'm actually going to agree with that, even oh. though I thought uh, the adjectives were overdone. That's something that's easily fixed. You can pare that down. Oh, wow. Uh, I think this one has the most potential, though. The first page. Wow. Whoops. Sorry about that. Transilience. Bye. Um, that's very interesting. So we've got two people who are going to go for Alan's submission. Um, the mirror. Um, I'm torn, actually. Um, I would very happily go for um, either that or Matthews. Um, I was I was well impressed by that, Matthew. Um, but I can't. <laughs> oh, what, a, what an anticlimax! We've got a database area here that's disconnected us from the uh, from the source of information here. So, what we normally do about this time, because I am actually going to go with the majority, um, what we normally do about this time is play some very happy music Kevin and Drack. some fireworks. Stop Dick. it! But I can't do that. I can't do that, unfortunately. So, what we're going to do instead is say, "Extremely well done, Alan. You did very well to get um, uh, that reaction from all of us." And um, we hope, since you are merely, what shall I tell them? I'll tell them, 23 years old, that you go on to wow. ha have a fa absolutely a fabulous writing career. Now, before we go, yeah. I do have to say thank mm. you so much to our very special guest here, Emma. Um, and your book has only just been published, and we're privy to go to your publishing launch. How amazing that was. Um, <laughs> did, you, did you enjoy yourself, or was it, was it 55 minutes of sheer horror? No, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed Did it. Did you? Because I, well, I'm only, I'm only two years away from these guys. You know, I was submitting for my book deal just over two years ago. Oh, so wow. this is all fresh in my memory. So yeah. it's an absolute privilege to be able yeah. to hopefully to do it. And also, it was great. It was lovely to meet Carol. It was lovely to, you know, to read some new stuff. Yeah, I loved it. Great. Well, Thank that's, that's very me. inspiring, actually. That's very, I mean, it's good of you to say that because, you know, you are two years away from a line that so many writers and, and authors find, you know, almost impossible to get to. So you've actually crossed it and you now are a happily published, I mean, I assume a happily published author. Very happily. And, <laughs> and you're here as a living example to everybody that it can be done. Isn't that brilliant? Absolutely. 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 Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, everybody in the chat room. Thank you, our fabulous narrators. It's been so good. I think we should do it all again this time next week. Have a great week, everyone. See you next Sunday. Yeah.